Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very warm welcome. Uh, so it's an, it's an interesting topic. It's a topic uh, that generates a lot of thinking uh, because we're talking about future. We're talking about a future uh, which may change, which has changed, which will change because of the impact of technology. And as I was uh, driving uh, for this session, I just thought on top of my head as to the kind of changes that technology has already done to our lives. And one of them is adjusting the mic. Uh, so what, what it has already done, yes, what it has already done uh, to our various facets of life. And I came up with a few, and, and let's just go over them just as an intro, just to set the stage of what we are going to talk about in the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, how words have changed meanings. Uh, tablet uh, was a medicine only, no more. Apple was a fruit, now it's a lifestyle. Let's look at the, what has happened on the social front. Uh, in yesteryears, and we're not talking about 20 years ago, possibly even 10 years ago, people would sit socially in their families or in their friends or amongst the friends and would talk to each other, having an eye contact, talking face to face. Today, they sit in a lounge together, looking at their mobile and communicating. Sometime, they actually communicate with each other, sitting in the same lounge via the mobile phone. So our social fabric has changed. Now let's look at what has happened to business, right? So in the business world, if I need to go somewhere, I send out a request via a machine. Machine picks up my request. It delivers the request somewhere in the cloud. Somebody picks up that request from the machine, machine guides him to reach my destination, I sit in the car, then machine guides him again to drop me to my destination, it happens, then machine tells the driver how much money is done, machine pays the driver, machine calculates and does the settlement, and the money reaches the account of the person via the machine. Imagine the future where you take out driver as well. That has happened. There is no boss. It's the machine which is the boss, which gives instruction and people take it. Yeah? And it's happening in this country as well. So that's on the business front. Uh, the world of internet and coupled with the world of mobile and software, especially software, has changed the world. While internet has increasingly shrunk the world and made it smaller, the world of mobile and especially software has completely transformed the world. And let me share some, some interesting things with you. Uh, wallet, wallet that we normally keep in our pocket is now a software. Anything in your wallet is a software. Your driving license is a software. Your credit card is a software. Your debit card is a software. Uh, your national identity card is a software. Your passport is a software. Music is a software. Camera is a software. Payments is a software. Business is a software. While the proverbial Kodak moment lives on, Kodak as a company is long dead. That's the impact of software as to what we see today. It's fascinating, and it is interesting how this will now pan out as we move into the world. So I've kind of laid the foundation of where we are today with technology and what has changed in the last possibly less than half a decade in many cases. Right. Now we have an international panel of speakers. So first of all, I want to thank each and every one Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for making it to this country. It's an absolute pleasure for each one of us in this room and outside to host you all in Pakistan. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Uh, then, uh, so, so the way we'll run this is that I will ask each of the 
panelist to give an intro as to how they see the world moving ahead and how they reimagine the world 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 5 years from now. And is there a crystal ball where we can actually predict and whatever we predict will not turn out to be an understatement five years down the road, as possibly the case has been. So, so they will share with you their own view of the world as we move into the future. Once that is done, I will ask each one of them a couple of questions. And if we have time, we will then open the floor for question and answers to the audience, depending on when the next speaker arrives. Okay. So thank you very much once again. Let's start. So I'll, I'll start with Sir Khalife. Um, if uh, you can be the opening batsman, as they say, in, uh, in Pakistan, which was be uh, passionate about cricket, right? Uh, and share with us um, your impressions of the city that, that you are in, and also your inspirations and how you see the future. Over to you. Here goes. Thank you very much for this privilege. This, this is how technology bring, brings us uh, an improvement. Well, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm really delighted to discover Pakistan. I was looking forward to be here with you. So this is my second day. I didn't know this country. And I've really been touched with the welcome of everyone. You're such a kind and... Uh, uh, passionate people thank you very much for this uh, for this uh, wonderful welcome well i have to tell you who i am i'm a french lebanese uh, i left lebanon in 78 in a very dramatic situation uh, our house had had been bombed destroyed one year before i was 12 i lost my father uh, he, who died in my hands so I had to leave. I was a refugee. I had to leave to go to France. And in France, I knew nothing, nobody. So I was in a boarding school, and I had to face uh, racism. It's, it was not very obvious, but it was always underneath. They always keep you feel that you're different. So from that experience, I had to learn how to fight, to struggle, to remain always positive, and never give up. And at the end of the school cycle, the school chose me to represent the school and all these old families were having their kids in this French school. They chose me to represent the school on a national uh, uh, level at the French contest, me, the Lebanese guy. So this happens how? Due to culture, because I was during the war in Lebanon, my, my mother uh, uh, gave me geographic, uh, ge geography books, history books, French books. So culture is very important. So what I want, I want to share with you is that point. Always remain positive, open to possibilities due to culture. And now culture is available on the web. We can get it everywhere. So this is me. So what I do today, I'm in two different domains. We install uh, 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 the future technology. We, we sell uh, to the mobile operators 4G antennas. And on the 4G antennas, we're using the 5G technology on the 4G antennas. It's a company called Kleos. You can find it on kleos.net. So we sell this technology to the operators. So we make it possible uh, to rural areas and very dense urban areas to have high-speed internet at distances from 15 to 20 kilometers. Nobody does that in the world. Uh, and uh, I'm a former Nokia general manager, <laughs> like my friend here. So it's really something important. And beside that, I've just uh, next week I'm launching a brand, my brand Maison Serge Califé. So it's a brand of organic and vegan perfumes, cosmetics, and makeups. Nothing to do with telecom and technology. And when I, I was talking like two years back that I'm going to do that, people would think, this guy is not serious. Now it's coming to real life. It's coming live next week. 
So it was, I've just seized the opportunity that were open to me. And I want each person in this audience to think, no matter what you feel, in what stage you are today, always keep in mind that you're precious, you have fantastic abilities, express them with what you have, and um, go meet the others, uh, absorb culture, absorb everything about technology, then you will make the future, because you will know, you will have no boundaries preventing you from doing that. So this is the message I wanted to share with you. It's not about talking about myself. Myself is not important. What is important is each one of you, how my experience can help you think and keep in mind a positive strength and energy to go towards the future. You will do the future. Don't let the future come to you. Go to the future and do it. So this is what I want to share with you. Thank you so much, sir. And, and we're talking about uh, a shrunk world, a connected world, a smaller world. And it was interesting that me and Serge, we've never met before. And before the session, as we were exchanging notes, we found out that both of us were hired by the same guy in Nokia. So it's, it, that's how, and we've met for the first time in Karachi. None of us ever thought that will happen, but it did. Uh, and Serge brings interesting points on values, on culture, and the fact that they will stay relevant into the future, doesn't matter what technology brings to you and how it will change the shape of the world. And, and that's an interesting point we'll part because when we go into question and answers, I would want to come back and have more discussions on this. Uh, so our, our next um, uh, panelist who will um, speak on the subject is uh, Tolly Macris, he's co-founder Extreme Sports. Tony? Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I lived the last 12 years in Thailand, was based in Bangkok, then moved to Rio de Janeiro, and just recently moved to be based in Dubai. The reason why I'm based in Dubai now is because I want to get a better understanding of the market around the UAE. We're doing a lot of business already in the UAE. We're working with the government, uh, taking sports to the next level there. We are based there, but it's not interesting for me because it's too small. You know, India, Pakistan, they are the big markets around. So the reason why I'm based in Dubai is to make business going forward in Pakistan and in the countries around the area because they are 200 times bigger than the Emirates. Um, I moved to Thailand in uh, 2004 because I saw a big opportunity to become rich through technology. In that time, it was uh, streaming, something new. I moved there to become a Muay Thai promoter. Muay Thai is a traditional Thai boxing. I am an organizer. We're doing monthly events around the world. And my big vision was to move there and build a streaming platform, because Thailand is the only place in the world where you have daily action. It's like you have here daily cricket uh, events. So Thailand is the only place in the world with daily fights in two stadiums in Bangkok. So my vision when I was moved there, I was 20 years old, and I thought, okay, if I set up a streaming platform here and understand this technology and master this technology, by the age of 30, I will be a millionaire and to return back to my country. So I start uh, promoting, I built uh, Elite Boxing TV, which is one of the biggest streaming platforms. We have produced and acquired more than 20,000 hours of content. We have live streamed hundreds of events from all around the world. And we made a lot of money and success with it. But the problem with that technology in the past, it was always going into one direction. You know, if I'm an organizer and I organize an event here, I make the money as an organizer. I stream the event through this technology of streaming all around the world. I make more money. But what is the audience getting? You know, you are the ones buying the tickets to come to my event. What are you getting back? You know, so now there is this new technology which uh, a lot of my friends approached me with, blockchain. Which I'm like, hey, it took me 15 years to understand streaming. You know, and now you want me to go into blockchain. So in the beginning, I didn't really want it because 
I succeeded already with the technology of streaming, but then I realized the potential of blockchain and how it can give back to the fans. It can give back to the athletes and it can give back to anyone around the event. So that's what I like about the blockchain technology. I still don't understand it and I don't have to understand it, but I understand enough to see that uh, it's a technology which is more transparent and it allows everyone to win. So instead of me doing an event now in Abu Dhabi next month and paying $100,000 to only the athletes, we're paying them now $80,000 and we are redistributing 20% of their purses back to the fans that are able to buy digital collectible cards through e-exports. And, and they can keep these cards then and earn tokens and redeem the tokens then back into our ecosystem, which benefits again the athlete because the athlete has the opportunity now to provide services for uh, these fans to redeem the tokens. But it also benefits the federations and the organizers because now they can boost their um, products and services inside the marketplace. So yeah, that's the reason why I'm still in this business and I see the future in the next 15, 20 years, especially in the sports industry, which is my expertise, that it will change and it will finally reward and um, give something back to the people that help to build these sports, you know, which are the fans in the end of the day, because they are the ones that are buying tickets, they are the ones that are buying pay-per-views, they are the ones that are buying merchandising, but then when these companies like UFC go out and sell for $5 billion, these fans that helped build the brands get nothing. So with this blockchain technology and tokenizing these assets, you know, and having everyone being part of future revenues, I think that's where the future in sports will go. And this is where I am really, you know, interested in this blockchain technology and how it can help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So on a, on a lighter note, let me ask a question. Are you a millionaire now? Um, Our tax department is very active these days, so, okay. so, so just be aware. I don't, I don't hold a Pakistani passport, but I have a <laughs> Greek passport, but I, I hope it's not broadcasting in Greece. Um, so Tolly talks about how technology will shape the future of sports and how he believes brands are going to evolve in a very different way and fans are going to get return on just be watching sports like never happened possibly up till now. Exactly, exactly. Because on my streaming platform, for example, if I have you as an athlete and you generate me a million views, I'm only making money on your advertising revenues. But now we link this digital asset of your video with your card, which is owned by your fans sitting here in the audience that come to see you, and they're also getting a revenue share on anything that you generated. Yeah. Great. So, so that means businesses will learn to share their pieces of the pie with their customers. And that's, again, a concept which is coming up, and it seems the world of sports is going to catch up with it very soon. So thank you very much, Tolly, for, uh, for the opening remark. Now we move to the only lady on the panel, um, Elena Nemchenko. She is the IT and project manager practitioner, and she has traveled to Pakistan from Ukraine. Elena, your turn. Thank you. Press on the button. Hello. Oh, yeah. So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I, I'm really happy to speak and I'm really happy to be here right now. So, talking about the future, yeah? Uh, why do we talk about it now? Uh, from my point of view, there is actually no future. There's only now, yeah? We have our thoughts, our actions, and consequences to those actions. So what is the point of talking about it? So um, actually, it's all about the fear. So um, what is the part of technology is about? Like, um, are we afraid of unregulated blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Or uh, are we afraid of artificial intelligence that will steal our consciousness? Well, for me, it's not a fear at all because we're all humans, and we won't let it happen, you know? We not, will not extermine ourselves. So, um, next point is, like, um, are we afraid of things that really does not depend on us? Some things that can be from external, like 
earthquakes, pollution, climate change? Well, definitely yes. And I think that technology must be the best partner to fight for this. So what is, what is our fear? What are we afraid of talking about future? We are afraid of wasting our time. We're afraid of working on something that we don't love. We're afraid of talking to people that don't believe in us. We're afraid about things that, uh, doing things that we don't like. So actually, things that we have to do, they're happening right now. So we're, we're afraid of criticism. We're afraid of t intolerance. We're afraid of boundaries. But actually, the positive thing is that all these boundaries are all in our minds, and we can fix it. So, um, what, is, like, what is my vision of the future? I think that technology must work for us, not us for technologies. We have to respect any individual from any age, from any nationalities, and from my point of view, we have to be kind to each other and uh, we have to, f to help or at least show a person to find his path so he can continue and continue doing things that he's aimed for. So if we see, if we can make one person happy, then we invent the future. And if we talk about technology, well, there are so many beautiful, inspiring, so talented people right now. So there's nothing to worry about technology. And I believe that we have to focus only about, not only, but my point is that uh, you have to, you know, listen to your heart and be kind to each other and help each other to, to you know, reach the goals that he is aimed for. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Alina. So one thing, um, Alina more or less has a crystal ball and, and she kind of emphasized. So what is not going away? And it doesn't matter whether we are talking about five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years down the road. What is not going away is the importance of humans, values, culture, and how you use technology to help all of this for a consistent, better present it doesn't matter how far into the future you get into. Great words. Thank you so much, Alina. Really um, uh, appreciate it. So, so now we go to the next um, uh, speaker who's come from Sweden, but he's already turned into a Karachiite, um, uh, uh, as they say. So um, may I request Johan Bertman to please um, give his opening remark. R Johan is a co-founder on the ground and Director of Operations, Cardoba Venture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And there we go. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Um, thank you so much for, to all the panelists for going before here. So um, I think Karachi being the city that it is, a lot of you are not born here originally. Uh, and as you can see, the same goes for me. Um, many of you probably came here for different reasons. I came here this summer because I needed an antidote to Switzerland, where I was living at the time. <laughs> Um, and I think I found the perfect antidote in Karachi. Uh, I came originally for six weeks intending to work on a project um, and uh, then go and do my master's in the US, but ended up actually finding it so exciting that I put off the master's and said, I'm going to come back and let's get some work done. Um, in terms of the technology side of things, um, I think it's interesting to turn it around. So there is a book that I'm sure many of you have read called Sapiens, or at least started to read. I've started to read it. Uh, I didn't quite finish it yet, but I hope someday. In this book, um, they talk about how in the agricultural revolution, what essentially happened to humans is that we were enslaved by wheat. A little weed that made us move into villages and cities to cultivate it and give it water and good grounds to, 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 uh, to grow on. Um, and what happened there was that in, uh, as, as humanity, we were better off, uh, but individuals were much worse off in these cities because they were ripe 
uh, with crime, with disease, etc. I believe that at this point, we are at the same, uh, same verge and the same thing with technology. Uh, but here again, we have a choice. So technology, if you look at it now, we're changing everything that we're doing to fit with technology. We're changing the way we educate people. We're changing our laws. We're spending millions and billions of dollars to technology. Um, and we need to think about how we can make this shift, this fundamental shift in trajectory for humankind, not only benefit humankind as a whole, but each and every individual. And I think one thing that we're seeing um, in the organization that I'm working with here in Pakistan called Cordoba Ventures, um, as we're trying to launch consistent quality healthcare services for the middle income segment, is that there are some barriers to finding and improving the lives of those single people. Um, so for example, we're seeing a big opportunity in the interplay between brick and mortar and digital. A lot of companies in Pakistan now are going into purely digital plays with, um, uh, with telemedicine. Um, and they're doing a fantastic job. But there's some barriers to real scale. Um, as an example, Pakistan has 220 million people, right? Each year there are about 800,000 consultations uh, with the doctor on the phone. In Sweden, where I'm from, we have 10 million people. It's a tiny country. It's, I mean, it's like a one block of Karachi. Um, so we have 10 million people, and we have 250,000 of these consultations every year on the phone. So that tells you that there is some kind of barrier to growth and scale in terms of digital health technology in Pakistan. Um, probably what we're seeing, one of the factors is the payment technology. Payment technology that is there, but that hasn't fully taken off in terms of mobile money, etc., like it has in many parts of, of Africa. Um, and we believe it comes down to um, a societal factor, which is trust in the system. Um, because how can I trust a digital transaction if I don't trust the system that's handling it? Um, I think many of you uh, also agree that Pakistan is a, is a country where you have to touch something for it to be real. Um, people like to handle cash. Uh, people like to have printed papers to do things. Um, so in order for this to, to move forward, I think we need to move to to a place where people can also believe what they see and not only what they, what they touch. Um, incidentally, there is actually every year, I don't know if you've seen this, but there is a, um, a world survey that goes out um, that asks people uh, um, how much they trust people, essentially. And the statement they ask, do you agree with that you can trust most people? In Sweden, 69% of people agree with that which is also why we get ripped off all the time <laughs> when we travel. <laughs> but in Pakistan, actually only 24% agree with the, with the statement that, that most people can be trusted. Um, so there you have a, a, a challenge, really. And on top of that, when you look at trust, you sp split the population into two, two different groups. So the mass population and the informed public. And all of us are here are the informed public because we're here talking about the future, we have education, etc. And so, if we are at 24% trust in, in, in the general system, the mass population are at an even lower trust in the system. So I think, to wrap it up, if we are to drive digital technology and have that really transform our societies, we need to take the point of view of the mass population, of the people that trust the system the least, and we need to leverage the interplay between brick and mortar and digital to help them and educate them so that they can trust the system. Because incidentally, they will also be the main benefiters, benefactors of a system that can grow digitally far beyond where we can build hospitals and build uh, primary care centers. Um, and so hopefully uh, that's what we, what we can do um, together here in Pakistan. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Johan. Um, in, again, a uh, very um, interesting perspective from Johan because he, he talked about uh, the interplay between the physical world and the digital world, which, by the way, is a, is a massive topic all around the world, how much digital you need to get versus how much physical you need to stay and how the interplay between the brick and mortar or the physical world and the digital world will pan out the world of the future. Uh, he also mentioned a very interesting fact, which is about this 24% trust in people. 
And um, if we each one of us look at ourselves and say when someone says something, how much is relevant? And then with that stems the need of having strong systems and processes and building trust in systems and processes using technology so that overall a society is created which trusts the system and which also trusts the people. So that's a, that's a very interesting perspective on, on both digital and physical world and how trust can play a role as we move into the future, defining uh, or reimagining uh, using technology. So the last uh, panelist on uh, our uh, uh, this esteemed uh, panel is from Australia. Um, he uh, told me he's not Chinese, and I'm fine with that. Um, right? Uh, so it's Sam Lee. Uh, Sam, thank you very much for being here. Sam is the Chief Executive Officer of Blockchain Global Limited. So something which some of the panelists also spoke about, uh, about blockchain and how it will help the sports industry as an example. And Sam would also share his experiences and uh, his views on how possibly blockchain will, re will reimagine a new world. Sam, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'd like to start the story off with my grandfather, who is a Red Army general of a Chinese Communist Party. He said that when he finally won the war against everybody who's not communist in China, the first international flight that came into communist China was from Pakistan. Pakistan was one of the most advanced nations back then. And in his heart, as he is in aged care facility right now, he still thinks Pakistan is the most advanced nation today. <laughs> this is all recorded, so uh, you can play it back as many times. But more importantly, to, to me, to me, when he's in his state of dementia, not really remembering much of the world anymore, he says to me that our brothers in Pakistan share a relationship with us. And this relationship extends beyond generations. And what China has done uh, through its tailored capitalism that embeds this one-party state system is it has built trust. CCTV and credit scoring ensures that fraud doesn't get out of hand. The ability to have mobile payments means that there is a cashless society in all major first-tier and second-tier cities. WeChat Pay and Alipay didn't exist before 2012, but we were able to then, through this adoption of technology, leapfrog and now don't even recognize not only plastic credit cards, but we don't even recognize banknotes. What everybody has been hearing about is blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. And I, I'm sorry, right? My company is called Blockchain Global. It means two things. I'm going to talk about blockchain. And secondly, my company has been around for quite some time. So we get to call ourselves Blockchain Global before anyone else. Blockchain is just a technology stack. It's a new one. But distributed ledger technology has been around for a very long time. And the underpinning system benefits countries like Pakistan the most because just like where I met Asfar at Davos at the start of this year and introduced him to blockchain, I said, Accenture, one of the leading consulting companies in the world, has made their theme at Davos this year saying that trust is the new currency. And it's because of a lack of trust we have the debasement of the currency that is issued by governments. It is because of a lack of trust we have trade wars today. 
Everybody here who has a commercial interest or even has real estate has suffered. And that is why blockchain is a tool that empowers trust. And I really hope that we could all leverage this tool of trust to bring instant payments and a digital currency, government-backed digital currency into Pakistan so that we go cashless, just like our brothers in China, and we create a one belt, one road e-commerce rail because one belt, one road starts in Pakistan and if we don't make this work, it will end in Pakistan. So thank you so much. Wow, um, and, and just on the point that Sam mentioned um, as to where we were and the potential that we had uh, many years ago, it is not an, a secret that uh, Emirates Airline and Singapore Airlines were also started by Pakistanis and see where they are. Um, we have a great chance to leapfrog and catch on lost decades by using technologies that everyone is talking about. And, and this is our chance to do that. And Sam, thank you for also bringing up uh, Obar's uh, subject. Uh, and I, I do agree that um, just like One Belt, One Road is a game changer, uh, not just for this country, but also around the world. Uh, having an Obar e-commerce gateway could be something uh, of a great vision and which can definitely be built on. So thank you very much for great work. Very inspiring word, and you heard the clap. Uh, uh, we love when someone praises us, right? So thank you very much for that. So now um, I'll go to the questions as we have done the opening round, uh, and I'll ask questions again in no particular order to the panelists uh, based on some of the comments that they made, uh, and I'll start with uh, Serge uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, the, this Q&A session. And uh, each one of you, depending on the time, please have your questions ready. We will... Uh, come to you as well uh, during the course of uh, this conversation uh, and um, uh, you know just keep it precise so that we can have more questions depending on how much time we get. So sir you talked about the importance of values, culture, humans um, and the fact that these values are not going to go away. As you reimagine the future with technology how do you think the technologies are going to play a stronger role in strengthening the human value mm -hmm. and the value of human? Because there is a fear that humans will be replaced by machines. And um, interestingly, the jobs will go away. By the way, just to share an interesting fact, World Economic Forum says, so will the jobs be lost? Yes, they will be lost. So World Economic Forum says, 70, by 2021, 75 million existing jobs will be eliminated due to technology. But in the same breath, World Economic Forum also says that 133 million new jobs will be created because of technology. So it's about how you reskill yourself and how you stay relevant. So I just want to bring your attention uh, towards how you think the value of human uh, culture, uh, economics will play a role in the future and will technology change everything? And, and will it become a concept that's good to talk about but may not exist because humans may become irrelevant? Um, thank you for asking this question because this is a really a topic I've always thought about um, with a long experience in telecom and also in the world of perfume. Um, you said that it's important that the values remain at the center. Uh, technologies, we heard a few minutes ago that technology should be used as a tool. And you know in telecom, uh, we talk a lot about 5G. And 5G is very interesting because it's, go it's going to be very useful for the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things means that every object will be connected, right? So if every object will be connected, it means that it will dialogue with servers and it will save us a lot of time. So there are lots of 
uh, uh, actions that we will not have to do anymore because the things will do it for us. So this means, what do we do with this time that we save? How do we use that time? And here we come to culture and values. If we use that time to increase our level of knowledge, of spirituality, of values, we can become better persons, and especially we can take time to take care of the others. When we take care of the others, when you, me, each one of us use the time left, because for example, computers help us uh, save lots of time. If we, we use this time that is left for us to take care of the others, to show them our affection, our love, our care, don't you think that our future will be better? If we, if we take time to think about, we talk a lot about reducing the carbon footprint. How we can do that today, in Europe, for example, in France, a lot of people think we are going to buy organic food. Why? Because we're fed up with all these industrial products full of allergens, of chemicals that are very bad for our health. So how they do that? They start uh, uh, buying vegetables and fruits from the guys who are cultivating them next to their house. So they reduce, naturally, the carbon footprint. It means that... So the future might be going back to some uh, uh, fundamental rules to simplify our lives. Why would I buy an apple coming from Australia when the, the cultivator next to my house is cultivating another sort of apple and if he cultivates it without pesticide, I'd better go eat this apple next to my house rather than buy the one coming from Australia. Sorry, Sam, nothing about Australia. <laughs> but it's just, I'm, I'm using an extreme example. So maybe the future would be to simplify our lives, to use uh, uh, natural uh, vegetables and food, use the time, use the time saved by the Internet of Things, let the machines do things that are taking uh, uh, our time, and use this time to absorb culture, to absorb artistic values, spiritual values. Take time to take care of the others. Show them our love, our affection. So this is how we may secure a better future. It's not only about technology. Technology should be a tool to help us uh, uh, strengthen our spiritual uh, uh, values, our loving values toward the others. So I, I've been maybe a little bit too long, but I needed some time to express this, that I feel s since I was thinking about that for such a long time. <laughs> yeah. no, thank you, Serge. Uh, and these are uh, beautiful words. Um, you also mentioned about user experience and simplicity. Uh, I, I very strongly believe that simplicity in the world of today and in future will equal scalability. So the more simple you are, the more scalable you will be. And everything today and in future will be driven by user experience. How easy and simpler you make it to the user will drive your success uh, of the future. Uh, another interesting uh, fact that uh, uh, was spoken is about technology will give us more time to focus and go back on the basics of the physical world. And that's an extremely important point for everyone to understand. I want to move to Tolly now, uh, and since we are a sports-loving nation, um, so hence, you know, you are the best person to maybe give us a view of the future. So there is a growing concern uh, around the world that uh, physical sports may die because the digital sports are, are taking over and the youth doesn't want to indulge in physical activities as much as, for example, previous generation was doing. So how do you see technology changing the way of physical sports? Do you think it will stay as it is today? Or will it change the shape? Or you think digital sports will actually take over the physical sport and, and this whole industry will have a completely new shape than what we see today? 
Thanks for the question. Uh, I don't believe, and uh, my partner, who is the president of the AIMS Alliance of All Independent Sports under the Olympic Committee and the vice president of the umbrella organization of the Olympic Committee, we don't agree that uh, digital sports or e-sports or computer gaming will ever be as big as real sports because there's nothing more fun taking a ball, going out, playing, you know, being active, uh, engaging with friends. Uh, we're not afraid about that, you know, and it's like short-minded people who just scared who make the stupid statements. I, I don't believe in it, and the people who are the leaders of these um, uh, umbrella organizations and federations, our partners, they're not afraid about that. And we actually just think of how it can help us. For example, I'm on the executive board of the Muay Thai Federation. We have 1.5 million athletes worldwide in 126 countries. And we, you know, it's a Muay Thai, Thai boxing, which 80% of our athletes are male, right? Uh, we see a huge increase now of female training Muay Thai because it's an effective workout to burn fat, to get fit, to uh, be more empowered, more self-confident. So we are thinking right now, how can we bring these women in to our sports without the side effects, you know, that we have, you know, getting hurt, like you see my face full of scars. And this is where we see actually a benefit by working together with the esports, you know, creating games, virtual games, where we allow now also the woman to participate in a fight by wearing these uh, virtual glasses, you know, and sensors in the hand and fighting against someone else on the other side of the world, uh, getting a full workout for 30 minutes, burning 500 calories without uh, getting hurt, you know. So, like I said, and when we look at this, we then think from the 1.5 million active athletes right now, if we have partnerships like that, then we will be able to have 5 million athletes. So, it will not affect us in a bad way if we know how to work with this esports industry together to create something great, you know. Thank you. So, um, so the good news is that the physical world and digital world will continue to work together even in the world of sports and some of the apprehension uh, that people may have about youth not going towards the physical part may not be, may not have substance. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Uh, Elena, I now want to come to you because you uh, brought up this thought of you have thoughts, actions and consequences and you think that will continue to drive the future. But do you think when we talk about thoughts, actions, and com uh, consequences in terms of how human behaviors will change over a period of time, technology is irrelevant, or you think it has a very strong role in shaping the human value, so that's one. Secondly, you also uh, mentioned about living in the present and not being fearful of the future. Is that a good way to think of the future? Okay, so uh, what scares me the most is like when we are uh, so impressed and we're so deep into those technologies, we spend so much time into learning something, into, you know, thinking deeply in what can we change, but we don't really matter things that are around us, like the people, our relatives, you know, some things that are really covering us right now. Uh, so I think that it's better to focus on on details, on on people, you know. And we have to we we don't have to work for technologies. Technologies must work for us. That's it. Um, and the question. Well, we are creating technologies right now, so we have to base on our needs, on people, and on, uh, you know, values. So let's just grab it and create and go, go along. That's my point. You can't take humans out. So clearly, uh, no question on that. Uh, Sam, I, I want to come to you because you, you also said, uh, and we've heard that you know cash is the is the king. Uh, then we heard data is the new currency, and I believe it is. But you also introduced uh, another interesting facet to it, and you said trust is the new currency, right? 
and technology help build trust. And you also spoke about how frauds can be completely taken out by building trust and building systems uh, where people trust and, and fraud more or less are minimized or completely go away. So how do you see uh, technologies like blockchain uh, reimagine a world of payments, of e-commerce as we move into the future, or it's just replacing one tool with the other, which could be cash, credit cards, debit cards, some traditional pay payment gateway, and now we'll have something called blockchain. So is it just a replacement of tool, or will it change the way we think, will it change the way we interact, will it change the way we conduct our business and possibly our daily life? So how do you see blockchain impacting the future uh, in, in true sense, uh, and it's not just another one tool replacing the other? So, uh, like it or not, and um, this is a true fact, 30% of our global GDP is spent on trust-based services. And it is even more disproportionate in poorer countries that have not got the institution or compliance culture, as they call it. Now, compliance culture means you have to be rich so that you don't get, I guess, the um, uh, feeling that you should start stealing other people's money. But what people are is we're all, to a certain extent, a little bit greedy, and we're not perfect. We're flawed. But code, however, isn't. Once you migrate decision-making into smart contracts, you will then get true velocity when it comes to AI, big data, and cloud computing. Blockchain is the piece that ties everything that is trust-based together because it allows for immutable and transparent flows of data. Now, I'm just a very simple guy. Yes, I do investments. Yes, I run uh, some pretty significant funds. But the way I see the world is we're only here for a short time. So might as well make it a good time. And, and how do we all have a good time? We create the biggest amount of change for the most amount of people. And I'm not a smart guy, so don't expect me to come up with something new. Just let me bring what China has done in the digital payments round, in the e-commerce space, in what they have proven to be the global leaders when it comes to infrastructure and digital infrastructure. And bring that to Pakistan so that we could increase the velocity of cash so that everybody gets rich quick. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sam. Um, uh, uh, I'll just take one last question and I go to Johan. Uh, we had a brief uh, uh, sneak peek on how the sports industry will change the shape uh, because Johan is so passionate about health and working in the health sector also in Pakistan. So I just want to get a view of how technology you think will change the way health sector is currently being run, especially in the context of countries like Pakistan, um, and, and how technology will actually change or transform the health sector. Definitely. So I think, um, I think there are two main things that we're thinking about uh, at Cordoba Ventures right now. So it's one is the problem of access, and second is the problem of, um, of quality assurance. And I think we think, uh, obviously, that, that technology can have a huge impact in both of them. Um, touched briefly on the access before, and um, we think it's still, um, you know, in the early days when it comes to bringing uh, virtual or digital video consultations on the phone. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are other ways to bring healthcare out into, for example, interior Sindh through using things like the thing that Pakistan already runs on, which is WhatsApp. Exactly, you guessed it. Um, and so that's one side of the thing to bring the access. The other side, which we're very passionate about, is how do we use technology um, in the healthcare delivery to actually ensure a consistent quality of delivery? Um, so as, as you, many of you know, of course, there is a challenge around how to um, ensure that the delivery of healthcare is the same on a Monday as on a Friday, and that 
um, standards are being not just written down but also implemented. And by providing digital technology into the hands of frontline workers like nurses, like allied health workers, um, and as well doctors, to actually register uh, what's going on out there with patients on a daily basis and put those medical records on uh, you know, technical solutions just like the blockchain in the future, um, we believe that we can uh, have a better uh, understanding of how to improve quality and how to make uh, quality actually um, sort of be, be something that you can trust is there when you most need it, when you are hospitalized or need care. Thank you very much, Johan. So uh, as we wrap up the session, I think the key takeaways uh, from, from the session, uh, because everyone more or less spoke about humans. So one thing which is going to stay constant is the strength and value of humans. And that is not going away. It doesn't matter how technology will shape the future, one. The second takeaway is there will continue to be a strong interplay between the digital world and the physical world. So while the digital world is here to stay, exactly the same way the physical world is going to be here to stay. And whether you are in the health industry or the sports industry or the financial industry, this interplay will continue to happen. Third is that technology will build trust like never before. And that is the key item because human values are the foundation or the fundamentals of human values start with trust. And technology will help us get to that trust in a much better way than what we see today. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the panelists for having an enlightening discussion. I once again thank you all for making it to Pakistan. Hope you thank have you. a great stay. Once again, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.